And then the week after that, Tammy's going to do Gematria. And learn more on 73 and 37, which is about Jesus Christ. Awesome. Yeah, and I don't uh, have one more day on the um, And the, you know the, the thing that he had come up? He, I don't know. If who's anybody, that? Yeah, Michelangelo. It was the Sistine oh. Chapel. And it, what they'd done is they had taken pictures off the top and put them and redone them. We did them big so that you could walk through and it was at the gateway. Yes. Yeah, so the gateway. It was in, yeah. Yes. It was, I, I found out about it right before it was the last oh, day I and I, I texted I Robin and said, I, I know it's just a couple of hours, but this is the last day that it's here. Yeah, I, I, just, know. I went that earlier that day and I was like, no. he oh, painted like, just the women. It yeah. was just the little Jesse the women. But it's incredible. And so because it's been on the ceiling, we can quite tell. see it well. And understand it. I can explain so much more. And yeah. it's that it's Well, like let's get you in February. <laughs> or maybe that last that last week Where you want to get me In January. And we need to at least at least try to get more vision. We want to get through visions of glory in a fairly timely manner. Anyway, I'm gonna turn the time over to Helena for Visions of Glory. Well, welcome. All right, so we had sent out a note saying we were going to um, do chapter two. We're going to try and do chapter two and chapter three. And the reason being is chapter two has an element of heaviness to it. Which we certainly don't want to leave you with. It's also a little bit disjointed. He has these sort of random experiences that he can't really make sense of. Um, but isn't that like our lives? Mm -hmm. Most of us look at our lives to this point in our lives and we're like, we haven't quite put all the pieces together and made a whole lot of sense of it. Um, but chapter three is so phenomenal because it's just about the Savior. But the goal is going to be to end having finished chapter three. Didn't someone last week say that he's got the job and he works at the church office yes. now? Yes, he did, and his car. And the same car? Yeah, there's nine oh, chapters, you guys. We gotta go faster. Yeah, we're not. Because we will never get through this. I know. Okay, so if you have the newer book, it's page 35, but it's, we're going to start with Paradise Lost. Um, so I will start, I'm going to start reading the second paragraph. Before this, my life goal was to advance my career, to become a tenured professor and to retire by the time I was 50. My goal was to become rich, to become well-known, to write books, and to become famous. I wanted to work in the church, serving in any capacity, working my way up through the priesthood, as I thought of it at that time, proving myself faithful and of service to the Latter-day Church. Following this experience beyond the veil, I spent the next 10 years rearranging my life from egocentric to Christ-centric. It was not an easy transition. I came to realize that almost all of my goals were misaligned with God's plan for me. I had been taught all my life to make money, raise a family, to get known by the world, and then the Lord will use you in whatever way, because you will be skilled, rich, and available. Boy. That's wow, that's a weird way to think. I know. Well, that's what most people do think. <laughs> but it really is. Oh, yeah, I think a lot of people think that. Oh, yeah. Even in the church. Like, I'm not yeah, going into it. I see, I just because I don't think that way, that yeah, is shocking to me. Well, you're, you're, you're not the norm. That's why I'm You're not the norm. Yeah, you're not the person. Yeah, that's all I'm Right. But now turn the page because I want to pick out one <laughs> sentence because I think this applies to a lot of us. It's the next paragraph, the very last line. I had been of the mindset that I needed to get to a place in my life where God could know me, <coughs> see my good that. works. No, you can slow down. Where did you, uh, which parent? A new paragraph? So it's, I just one read, paragraph read. One. I read that paragraph, and then it's the next paragraph, the very last line, because I think it applies to all of us but Tim. Okay, oh, yeah. I'm going to start again. Here. I had been of the mindset that I needed okay. to get to a place in my life where God could know me, see my good works, <coughs> and my determination, and then he would know what I could do. <laughs> now think about that. Then. It is, so it is so backwards, but ask yourself, do you do that? Mm -hmm. Is this why, as members of the church, we tend to get lost in works? Yeah. We're checking off the box. We're checking off the mm -hmm. box. But why are we checking off the box? Is it because we don't know any other <coughs> way to show God that we love him, except by doing, 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 and we miss the entire purpose? But instead of beating ourselves up for always doing good works, I think this is a very, um, it's a beautiful way to look at it. Our motivation isn't necessarily to earn our way to heaven, 
Our motivation really is I don't know how else to show God that I love him, except to do. Good way to put it. So. I had a Christian friend say, you can't buy your way into heaven with good works, because a lot of Christians think mm -hmm. that that's what we are and do and yeah. how we believe. Yes, and we beat ourselves over the head for that, because sometimes we're like, is that what I'm trying to do? But I think if we say I well, tend to get lost in works, that? to show God who I am, I think it's, it's still wrong. But it's still the wrong approach, but it's a little bit more of a gentle approach where we understand that we can be. Well, it's I not wicked. It is a no, step above. It's, you know, it's still, yeah, it's ignorance. Yeah. And the backwards part is to show him so he would know what I could do. Oh, he's very well aware. Yeah. He knew what Jesus exactly. could do. He knows, he knows exactly. what each of us can exactly. and will accomplish. Exactly. Exactly. Accomplish. Yep. You don't need to prove it to him. Yep. <clears throat> so I would like someone to read the next two paragraphs. Janet, will you read those for me because it's sort of goes into a little more detail there. Uh, am I sitting in a good place for my I voice think to pick so. up? I'll yeah, just the, talk loud. People in the circle should I know that's should hard be able to believe. Yep. After that experience, I knew that God already knew me in great detail and far better than I knew myself. What he was teaching me in this experience was, Spencer, you have it wrong. You need to learn to see yourself as I see you and know yourself as I know you. Not the other way around. I already know all about you. Being out of my body and knowing without a doubt, with total surety, that there is a grand spiritual work and spiritual world that we can't see, took me out of a circle that circumscribed to only Spencer and expanded that circle of my understanding to include this unseen world of heavenly beings, including family members, angels, and Jesus Christ himself. It changed me forever. Can I comment on that? Absolutely. I want you to comment. The Lord gave me a course correction this year. In February, I had the first of three priests of blessing counseling me to teach about the last days. And that's completely changed my focus. And I've had all kinds of help. And I was told in that blessing that I have ancestors working to prepare for the events that are coming and that I could call upon them for help at any time. And I have a hard time believing that. That's such a change in my thinking. And I still need to remind myself of that and ask for their help because I get really stuck. I just, I, I watched one of Rhonda Pickering's videos last night and I realized I've got more questions than answers from this video. So. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So, is it the one on Adam on Diamond? No, it's the one on No Man Know of the Day and the Hour. So, yeah. Can I? But go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, because um, I'm kind of studying the, the beginnings of the church and how Joseph Smith thought about things versus how other Protestant groups thought about things, and really it affects how our church is today. Like, he believed that you could talk to God. He believed that there were well, sacred times. To and, right. sacred, <laughs> and he had that belief before it oh, happened. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. right? So he went at a certain time, we probably think it's the spring equinox, to a hill, to a tree, and he had the expectation. So there was something about sacred time, sacred space, sacred, mm. you know, locations and, and things. And so he believed that way. And so that was, there were a lot of people at that time that were believing that we wanted to go back to Christ's original teachings and, you know, go back to this concept. And his grandfather was a dreamer and his father was a dreamer, right? So they, he comes from more of the mystical side where the Protestant side had broken out away from the the Lutheran and uh, the Calvinist and all these people, and they just didn't want all the Catholic dogma that was limiting people, that you couldn't get to heaven except through that means. But they did not really believe that there were angels that would come and minister to them or that you could have revelation, that that was gone. It was something in the past. So it actually, those two things collide in the time that he is killed. And there are those that believe more in the organization, and there are more that believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Joseph Smith was definitely more of a gifts of the Spirit guy. But our church has really morphed more into the organization that makes it so that you can have gifts. But just like you were saying, I didn't really believe that I could call on my ancestors. However, it says in our belief that we believe in ministering angels, right? But we don't ever hear people talking about a visionary experience, or that's very unusual. And so we've, we've all kind of morphed to this one side. And here's this incredibly faithful, good, you know, determined man that's writing this book. And he's like, I was thinking this way. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I was shown, <coughs> oh my gosh, it's so much bigger. God knows me. I was sent here for a purpose. I was honed in the heavens in my pre-existence before I came with certain knowledge to expand it here. And that's the mission I'm being called to. And strangely enough, 
It has to do with the stars and when you were born. I mean, we want to say that that's something strange, but it is so much bigger than what we think. And all of our little interactions and what we bump into and all of those things really matter. And so when, that, when he had that near-death experience, he realized what he was been living in is the false belief. And what's true is way bigger than he ever thought and encompasses you know, all things. If you want to pre, uh, pre, uh, elaborate on that thought, listen to Michael Rush's video. The, the uh, reality is not what you think it is. It's far more awesome than you know. That's one of his videos, and you've got to get to the last third of that video, where yeah. he talks about all the worlds of God's creation and the place of the earth in the whole universe. Yes. It's very interesting. Because then once you believe we came here for a purpose, but we didn't start in the dirt here. We're not going back to the dirt here. Right? Yes. We are, it's beyond. So and I just love that. that, 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 that and if we believe in angels in the Book of Mormon, I started praying that angels would call certain people to repentance. <laughs> and that happened. I still believe that. And that's what Alma did. The Alma the older to his son. For his son, yes. Yeah. And so you can have the faith to do it. You can ask for angels' interventions and in well, it especially works in family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Absolutely. All right, absolutely. Let's keep going. Well, like, that was a huge. That's a huge thing that you just. No, I had like three stars folded down yeah. under like. <laughs> well, and, and we're not done. And we're not done. I'm going to summarize done. the next two. Um, two paragraphs because it goes into a little more details on how do we accomplish this so mm -hmm. everyone in this room knows that's where we want to go how do we do it so he says here it felt as if the angels had left a door open into the spirit world <clears throat> and suddenly he can see people differently than he did before he could see them through God's eyes he was able to love them more and sometimes the Lord sent him to help them in ways that was not possible and he said I suddenly realized that God's hand was working in my life. And as he started to respond to this and follow through on those promptings, he started to become more sensitive to spiritual things and more obedient in his response to them. And as he did this, his discernment improved. And he said, my compassion and understanding for these people became greater and he couldn't help but be sympathetic. Instead of judgmental, sympathetic. We need a response. So let's be sympathetic to what is going on with our brothers and sisters. All right. Who will read the first paragraph of We Are Never Alone? Okay. Hold up. Yeah. Another significant thing I learned was that we are never alone. Angels are always present, both good and evil. I also realized that by my behavior, mood, or thoughts, I was in control of who was in the room with me. I used to feel negative feelings or emotions and feel overpowered by them. I was startled to realize that I was dealing with dark spirits who overwhelmed me when I gave them permission by my emotions. I realized I was in control and I worked hard to remain positive and loving to invite divine beings into my life who uplifted me and those around me. It, was, it is a good tenet of my faith now that for good or evil, we are never alone. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Then he says that he realized that our agency is always honored. Even though we are surrounded by good angels, we still have to invite their intervention. Mm. Good point. That is such a critical thing to understand. How do we invite them? By prayer. By having hope. By feeling faith and belief. We actually have to ask for their help. And how do we do that? Please show me how. Please help me. He says it differently. Yes. Look at that again. Please show me how. Well, <laughs> thank you. Please help me. You're right. You're There's right. an exclamation yeah. point. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Please. Yes. Please. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and look at that last one. Save my children. Yes, yes. save my oh, children. Oh, I love that. I've never noticed that yep. before. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Robin. So, exclamation point. Exclamation point. You're right. I suppose the answer is it can be a very soft please or it can be a very heartfelt please. But as long as you are interacting and using your agency to call them in, they'll come in. So he says, all of these things trigger powerful things from the other side of the veil. Think about that statement for a minute. Your agency is triggering 
what happens on the other side of the veil. That's a really important statement. And they become even more powerful when we've learned to respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Because we can be given answers to these prayers more quickly and more profoundly. So that is our responsibility. Then he talks about what is happening on the other side of the veil. And I can honestly tell you I've never thought about this. He says, he is also using these experiences to teach on the other side of the veil. Because our prayers help angels to grow. They learn what it is like to be like God, to serve, and to relay God's answers to his children's prayers. So what Janet just bore testimony of is our ancestors on the other side who desire to serve God, they want to become more like God, and they want to help us as we ask. So let's not deny them this opportunity. So he says this process is extremely orderly and divinely orchestrated. There is no happenstance or coincidence in their work. The good angels are subject to his command and limited or empowered by our faith. Are you limiting the angels in your family from helping you? Because of your faith in what happens all around you and on the other side of the veil. There are no oops moments when dealing with God or his messengers. Prayers are never not answered correctly due to an error on the other side. How many times have you thought, oh, no, 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 that, 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 that can't be right. How many times have you heard your children say, God didn't know, he doesn't know what he's doing. I mean, they don't say it in those words. Yeah. But they do make those sort of questions. He's not paying attention. Oh, oh yes, he is. We just don't understand, you know, why things are happening. My best friend, uh, yeah, I, I told you her son died of cancer in August. <coughs> she just, what, she is relives it every day, and she says, "I am so angry because the prophet in conference said expect miracles. I expected my miracle, and God didn't give it to me, and shame on him." Yeah. I'm like, oh, whoa. Such a I know. Yes. But God did not say expect a specific miracle. Yeah, right. He said expect miracles. Yeah. Leaving it open. Yep. And then ask to see them because it hardly ever comes the way you want it, does well, it? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. And maybe this young man could do more good on the other side. Well, that's what we've told her. Yeah. He's preparing things. It's going to be hard for her to just, she's just dealing with emotions. Yeah. She oh, yeah. Emotions. This section reminds me of a book that my husband and I read this weekend, too. Thanks to um, Andrea. It was Swedenborg's um, Our Life After Death, and when he talks about children who die, that they don't just fly around like little angels, and <laughs> they learn, and they learn they opposition. <laughs> and I thought that was so interesting. These children that don't get a chance to come to our town are still learning through opposition. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. Sorry. <laughs> so, of course, they get to watch the things that we do and the things that we learn, and learn from it. And learn from it. Yep. <clears throat> So he says, everything happens precisely as God directs. That's an important statement for us to really internalize and to accept. So then he says that he was shown much of what he was trying to do was totally wrong for him. Do we do the same thing? Yes. So on the next page, he tells a story about being asked to go to a lady and, who had brain cancer and give her a blessing. And he went in there wanting to cure her. I mean, who wouldn't? Who, who wouldn't? The one with brain cancer. Yeah, the one with brain cancer. And he said when he laid his hands on her head, he saw that she wouldn't even survive the year. And he couldn't say that. So he gave her a blessing of comfort, but it was not the blessing that the Lord wanted her to have. And when the blessing was over, she said, why did you not tell me what you saw? She knew she was going to die, because the Lord had also told her. And she said, because it was God's will, it would help me accept it. Wow, is that powerful. It's what I needed to see. And even though you didn't say it, I saw it. So the Lord gave her a blessing that this man, probably in his loving kindness, mm -hmm. didn't want to give her hard news. Well, think about it. God knows what's in his mind as he's saying it. So 
boom, he's got to give it to exactly. him. Because that's what he wanted said, and he was defying what the Lord exactly. gave him. Exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah, but it takes a lot of courage to speak to things you know that oh. you're being told to say, but oh, you're yes. like, oh, they're not going to receive this well, because you're judging it. Yes. Instead well, of just, even if you yeah. question, what if I'm wrong? Yeah. What if I'm feeling I'm it, but it's not really the spirit? Yeah. yeah. And it's just something I want, yeah. or that I... I get it. Yeah. yeah. My family had a story, uh, had a similar experience with this. Luckily, it was in the exact reverse. But my, um, my little daughter was in a coma, and she'd been in a coma for three weeks. <clears throat> and uh, they were going to pull the breathing tube out, and they said, if she doesn't breathe on her own, she's officially dead. So I asked my husband to give her a blessing, and he goes, I can't. I cannot give her a blessing. He goes, I wouldn't be able to hear the Lord. I know what I would want to bless her with. So we called a friend to give a blessing, and he came and gave this little girl a blessing. And for all intents and purposes, she was dead. There was no spirit in her body. It was literally just a shell being kept alive by machines. <clears throat> and he laid his hands on her head and started to give her a blessing, and then he got completely silent. The silence where you're like, <laughs> is he still there? <laughs> you know, and it was probably two minutes of silence. And he told Whoa. us afterwards he was literally arguing with the Lord because he did not want to say what the Lord had told him to say. Mm -hmm. And finally, he was able to say, he said, she will live and she will be healed in God's way and in God's time. Mm -hmm. And he said, I didn't believe it. He said, your daughter was dead being kept alive, and he says, I had no belief that she, and he goes, and I was telling the Lord, please don't make me tell this family this, I don't want to give them hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that and that was 13 years ago, and my daughter's still here. And so, did she completely recover? <clears throat> no. According to his will and his way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, according to his, she, she's here, she still has a tumor, she still has deficits. Uh, she's not healed yet, but she's here, and she wasn't supposed to be. Um, so I think it works in both ways. You know, giving blessings. <clears throat> you know, when the Lord says, give this blessing, give it. So women can do this too. I do a lot of healing work with people, and I had a guy come to me, and he had esophageal cancer. And then I knew he wasn't going to live very long. And I always ask the Lord, can I tell him what you've told me? And he said, yes, tell him. And I said, are you aware that you won't be here very long? And he said, no, I was not aware of that. And he prepared Exactly. Yeah. And he wasn't around very long. Yeah. It's a blessing, isn't it? To yeah. know. Truth is good. Yes. But yes. always ask the Lord if you can tell them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's a good way to handle it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Spencer then says, unfortunately, I was not strong enough to speak the words properly. So Father showed this young mother the same vision that I saw on her behalf. <laughs> and I learned much about my responsibility to do his work. Even though fear tries to stop me from saying what has to be said. Oh, wow, it is always the right thing to do. And I tried from then on not to fear the emotions and concerns of men more than the will of God. <coughs> Such a valuable lesson for all of us. Um, then, can you relate? Because now he talks about he's had this great sort of awakening and his family hasn't. And he said he realized now with his family that he had tried to instill his dreams in his wife and children for years. And now he was faced with trying to teach them why I had completely <laughs> changed my life and my goals. Who's been there? Haven't we all been there? Where the Lord has shown us something and now we've got to go back to our spouse or our children and go, yeah, no, 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 I'm on a, I'm on a different path now. And they're like, no, I don't want you on a different path. Stay on the same path. And now you're, you're stuck and kind of in the same place uh, that he was, and uh, and he talks about you know people just resist the changes that he was trying to make because nobody, the adversary and all the devils around, they don't want us to progress. So then they start they'll start to use the other people in your life to say no 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 hold the course, don't don't switch, don't change, just stay exactly where you are. And when you can see them sort of working through those you love, it's it's pretty interesting. Then he just talks about, uh, he could see why things happened to him. He had a lot of illness. This poor man had a lot of illness. And he did say that he realized he had set himself up for these illnesses by continuing the unhealthy emotional state that I had acquired from childhood. You know, I have to just stop and ask you to introspectively look at that statement. What unhealthy emotional state do you still have from childhood? 
that you don't know what to do with, that you have suppressed, but it keeps manifesting in some way in your life. Yes? Um, I, I'm a mental health counselor and therapist, and this is the major problem with almost everybody that comes. Amen. Is that the, their past, yes. some difficulty, it could be a variety of things, but yeah, a, lo a large percentage of the population do. Yes. I completely agree. Yes. I think that too uh, goes to where you've got to learn to forgive yourself and and people in your past too to move forward. Yes. To heal. Yep. I think if we look at a lot of the triggers that happen to us in our lives, we are getting triggered <coughs> at our age by something that happened in childhood. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, by imperfect parents that didn't mean it, right. but they were doing the best they could, and they were wounded as well. Like I keep saying that our bodies are 86% water, which is and it holds memory. Mm -hmm. And so water holds memory. And so it's not just our lives, it's our ancestors' lives. Yes, it is. So yes. that's, I was reading a, a thing on reincarnation. That's what that the, the old definition of reincarnation was. Is not we're going to live again in someone else's body. It's your ancestors are living through you. And you're, that's the, the, the Nelson's book. Yep. That's disgusting. Right? That can cause a, a lot of um, enmeshment, though, with our ancestors, if we feel their spirits, to not be boundary and contained with just, this is our garden raw, as we say, I'm ready for wholeness. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I love it. Yeah, I love it. Um, so he said he had not yet learned um, not to let these trigger events manifest as physical illness. So there's a really cool message there. The next time you deal with some physical illness, to get on your knees and to ask, why am I creating this? Well, also ask, what is it that I'm going to learn from it? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And maybe that illness is so you can practice healing yourself and know that you are a healer. Exactly, exactly. But if we just suffer in silence and don't ask for help, then we don't learn from it. All we do is suffer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he also learned that, you know, he worked too long, too hard, didn't eat well enough, didn't sleep well enough. I mean, we all know that. You know, Robin taught us that, what was it, last week or the week, or the week before, <clears throat> that we are physically responsible for our bodies, as well as these emotions that are trapped there. Um, then he says, I now know that before I was born, I chose this course for myself. Do you have a testimony of that? Yeah. Yeah. I do too. I think that's where our forgiveness comes in too. I was to do this. So it's okay to say, as hard as this was, this experience, whatever, I forgive myself because I came to learn this. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. And he does say, he said, now I know that I would not go back and choose a different path even if I could. Mm -hmm. If you are not to that point in a trial, hang in there. I believe we will all get there. Yes. where we will be grateful for the things that we have experienced. But we do have to kind of move through some of it before we And it's so part. funny because my husband and I were in the uh, <coughs> truck yesterday driving. We were talking about some of the things, the trials that we've had and uh, throughout our married life. And we look, looked at each other and said, wouldn't change a thing. Yep. Yeah. Wouldn't change a thing. Have had a glorious life. Yeah. But in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Oh. I want to change hell. this right now. This hell. Is. Yes, hell, while well, yes. in the middle of it. Yeah. But the lessons that you learn at the end turn out to be worth yeah. it. But and it's hard it's to tell still someone hell. I mean, nothing's Absolutely. perfect. But, oh yeah. yeah. Don't want to go back and repeat right. it, but grateful for the lessons. Yes. Yes. Yep. Well, then, yes. The older you get, the more you look at other people's trials, and you think, I really wouldn't want that one, and so yeah. do I have. You, mm -hmm. you have enough of those experiences, you're just left with what you have. Yes. <laughs> so you realize, you realize you probably chose it, and then, and you also see the benefit of these trials as you go through life and exactly. conquer some of them, and exactly, you, know, you get a perspective. So there's yeah. one good side to aging. Yes, <laughs> there's quite a few. There are quite a few. All right, then he has an experience in Tahiti that I'm going to go through kind of quickly and just focus on what I think is the more important Can I say part. something, too? Of course. Okay, so I went to Tahiti in November of 1995, and I really related to everything he said here. I'm like, oh, my gosh. 
this was so cool to me because within six months. And so, anyway, I just had to cool. say that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I really related. He sets the scenario up, and I'm assuming you've all read it, so I'll just hit on a few things. He makes the point, he goes, I can't sleep on a plane. So he gets there, and he's really, really tired. His family's hungry. They want to go to dinner. And he's like, I'm just way too tired. I am going to go to bed. And as he falls asleep, he recognizes that his spirit <clears throat> lifts out of his body. And he's like, oh, no, I'm dying. I think probably all of us would, would feel that way. But he's had these experiences before. But he says, this time, it was different. He said, I was totally alone in the room. There were no other spirits to greet me or watch me. And he said it was pretty disconcerting to be in a world where he knew it was filled with spirits, and yet he couldn't see any of them. Mm. So he started to plead, Heavenly Father, please send me a righteous spirit to be with me. That is a lesson in and of itself. Yes. When you ever feel forget, alone. We can do that. Yes, don't forget. Yeah. You don't have to be alone. You can definitely ask. But he doesn't get it. He hears a voice that says, you need to go through this darkness okay. to understand what is coming. Are you in the middle? Where are you? Yeah. Oh, I've skipped through. Sorry. I'm on 42 middle if you're, oh, if you're on the new I book. Sorry, I just, yeah, I just skipped through a few of these. Because you don't need to hear all the backstory. What's, what's the beginning of the paragraph that you're in? I'm going to start reading, it was meant that I needed. So oh, let me read that paragraph, paragraph and you guys find it if you're following along. So he said, it was meant that I needed to understand suffering by viewing evil at its darkest. I was naive at this time. I wanted to believe in the inherent goodness of people. Oh, haven't we all been there? Oh, yeah. And I'm, I'm afraid a lot of members are still there oh, yeah. today. I was shortly going to see and vision a people whose only purpose in living was to do evil. Oh. They preferred evil and debauchery over everything else. They delighted in other people's suffering and were bored and depressed when they were not hurting someone. I did not even know such people existed, let alone that they constituted a whole society. Wow. Now, for many of us in this group, I think we can say, perhaps in the last 10 years, the Lord has brought us through this. You know, and all I need to say is Balenciaga. Mm -hmm. And yeah. to realize that this is going on in our day and age. Yeah. And when you first learned about it, you felt Shocking. nauseous and you couldn't sleep. And you didn't understand how people could hurt people the way they are doing it in our world. Children. Oh, yeah, children. children. All That's of it. Worst. All of it. So it's interesting that he, that Spencer had to see it, and I think each one of us has had to see it also. Or we're seeing it. Or we're seeing it, or we're suddenly waking up to it, and it is very, very unpleasant. But it is an important, integral part of this learning. The thing that's scary is there's so many people who don't even see it. No. They don't see it. They're in this little bubble. I know. Right. And it's a normalcy thing. They, well, they don't want to see it. They put up the normalcy and bias. And the normalcy yes. bias. Yeah. And everybody's good at heart. We're just different backgrounds. Yeah. No. I know. Because we tend to see the world how we are. Right. Good point. You know, I mean, I apologize before something. I smash a fly. But I still smash it. <laughs> yeah. I, know. I don't apologize. <laughs> I, don't like, I, don't like, I don't even like to do that. That's how they convince us to be part of this whole equity. But they're really good people. Right. We really all deserve to be treated well in this area. Yeah. yeah. And then you start to realize that the majority of those that rule us are a part of that chapter that I have just read. And that is, that's a hard one to, mm -hmm. you know, to wrap your head around. It, it really is. Well, then he goes into explaining why. And I think this is helpful for all of us who have awoken to the evil in our world. He has said, I have been shown great light. Visions of God and angels, and in order to comprehend greater truth and greater light now, I had to understand its opposite, the pure evil side of the equation. All things in mortality and eternity exist in opposites. To comprehend greater and greater light, I had to also comprehend greater darkness. Tell us where you are, please. She's right in that same the paragraph. Okay. Okay. Page 47, up at the top. I have I'm been well, shown great really light. Really I do. Okay. 47. Okay. But think about Joseph Smith. 
in the garden. He had to have that. And mm -hmm. the great dark came to him first before he had the light. Exactly. Same exact thing. Exactly. And Mike Stroud once said something very interesting. He said, we sort of falsely believe that God will just give us the amount of light that we need in order for us to progress. And he said, that's not actually true. He said, God will give us the amount of light to the level that the amount of darkness will not destroy us. So the important thing for us is to be able to master the level of darkness that is matching our light. Because when we can overcome that darkness, we can now have a, more, a higher level of light, knowing that a higher level of darkness we will also be exposed to. God doesn't want darkness to destroy us. So he will only give us the level of light where we can withstand the level of darkness. And that puts Joseph Smith into that yeah. same perspective. God knew that that experience with Satan would not destroy Joseph because of what Robin was just saying, mm -hmm. how the family had been raised. Yeah. Joseph had been taught before he even came onto our scene. Mm -hmm. You know, he had a really good family who taught him enough light that that darkness would not destroy him. Can I please just, I always find it so interesting to look up words and debauchery, right? You think that's, it's, it's bodily pre pleasures in excess, but it uses like lechery, sexual sins. It's a lot of sexual sins, but it also has drugs and alcohol, but it comes from the word debauch which means to lead astray. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that whole thing, and that's that animal nature, which can be an enemy to God, right? That leads, it's those sensual, sexual, but depraved, what is it, craven, or, you know, evil is in, in that. And it's like, oh. And that's what they're doing to the children. I mean, yeah. that, that well, the whole that, society. Uh, Balenciago. Balenciago. You think about what that, what that yeah, meant. That so planned and orchestrated. Well, what's the plan? And I, I'll, I'll send that to you. But is I just saw an interview in my old school district in California, and and I remember I had saw that they were changing history and you know pushing same sex stuff. Well, our our Instagrams and our Facebook and that they have algorithms to push these children into these things, and unbeknownst to parents. You know, they're pushing, um, if they heard, like, in kindergarten that a, a worm is both a male and a female, or that you, like I was saying, playing with mattress cars, yes. and you enjoy that with your brothers, but your girl inside, they plant that seed, and then on Instagrams, it kept pushing and pushing, and this girl was was pushed into changing, um, you know, her, her parents accepted her, but to, 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 to take the hormones and to, you know, cut off her breasts and do all those things. And then, then she awakened to who she really was. And her name's Chloe. And, and, oh, is that know, the Glenn Beck thing? It, 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 yeah. 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 It's, it's yeah. my Teneo Valley yeah. school district, but now she's speaking out. And this is that same school district that allowed a boy to masturbate in class. I mean, it's gone down so, oh yeah. And, and they just blew it off. Well, that's normal. Yep. <laughs> So we've got to, it, we don't know as parents, if we don't awaken, we, these, this evil stuff is coming through their phones. We're letting strangers into our homes yeah. through our yeah. the devices. Yeah. Well, even our state flag. Mm -hmm. Our state flag, is, yes. it's got a lot of symbolism in it, but the new flag that they're proposing has the Star of Ishtar on it, and she's the goddess of sexual perversion. Oh. So oh. on the Utah state flag, we're going to have a representation of the Not goddess yet. of sexual perversion. We didn't perversion. vote. Yes, I mean, that's debauchery, yeah. of representing our state. Yeah. But it, it's the ignorance of people not knowing to speak up. I mean, we just let them do this. You know, well, what is the flag going to be in there? We, I don't know. we didn't vote yes for it yet, yet though. No, we, I, I wish we could. There's so many things to fight for, though. Yeah. We're not really fighting for our flag, but I sure wish we could. Because our old the Utah flag Parents United are, are fighting, so, yeah. and there are a lot of active, active people. Yeah. So I think and we, we need have to a join coalition. Them. Yeah, we, we do have need a coalition to join them, because we just can't let yeah. Utah be represented. Yeah. Let's no. send by, our, our state you know, representatives. Yes. Can I say one quote? That yes. We've, we've That's seen the weaponization of the FBI with Twitter and yes. how they colluded yeah, they and did. in suppressing through social media with the E-L-E-C-T's. <laughs> um, guess who said this? The individual is handicapped by coming face to face with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists. Yeah. Just like the Nazis. Mm -hmm. That was the first director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, mm -hmm. that said that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was already planted. 
way before, before we all even the born. whole blueprint. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Let's keep reading because this paragraph is beautiful. Sorry, I'm right in the center of the paragraph that I was just reading. Even Jesus Christ had to descend below all things before he could rise above all things. Mm -hmm. The same things Perfect. seem to be true for me, though in a far lesser degree than our Savior, of course. So now put our world into that perspective. <coughs> You know, that we have to see the descent. We well, just do. Can I say this? What's coming in the world, in this country, and in Armageddon, and the abomination of desolation, is the worst of times before we get to the best of times. Exactly. It's where, so it's the greatest, I thought that we're heading into the greatest confrontation between good and evil in the whole history of yes. the world. Yes, and we also and so we have, have to, to descend sides. before we ascend. Thank you. Perhaps exactly. in many worlds. I think we're yes. in the middle, middle of it. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to be ascending out of it. We, yeah, we're we in the just are in the appetizer stage. Well, and the Lord has not shown up yet. That yeah. horrible thing. So we, we have to for us. So we should be grateful that He's preparing us. As, as horrible as that may yes, be, that I agree. It. You know, we yeah, should be grateful for it because how do you how do you accept that? I mean, I mean, it's just like taking that child and putting him in complete horror, and they haven't even seen anything. Exactly. You know. Exactly. Yep. So then he says, still, the divine laws that govern these blessings demand the juxtaposition of good and evil. And I had to understand this by personal experience. And we do, too. So therefore, he had to experience feeling this frightening aloneness, this separation from God that he had never experienced previously. Apparently, he also needed to know what it was like to feel completely devoid of the Holy Spirit Mm. In order to appreciate and understand the greater blessings that I had been shown could be mine. The Savior experienced that. If you have not experienced it, wait, you will. <laughs> you will. I do believe yeah. all of us has to experience for a short time the Spirit leaving us to be completely alone. We just need to remember it's temporary and it's just so that we can learn. All right, let's read the Diorama of Hell. Who will read that for me? Will one of you two read it? The first two paragraphs. <laughs> oh, okay, I don't know. <clears throat> the rest of what I am now going to relate, I still don't completely understand. It was shown to me as if it were a diorama passing in front of my spiritual body. It was three-dimensional, but I was not in the scene. I was looking at it as a spectator. What I was shown was the history of the spiritual and non-spiritual practice of the ancient Tahitians. I was shown the initial, that initially they were enlightened and spirit-filled people, even innocent and undefiled. They knew about Jesus Christ, his role and his mission, which had come to them from the holy men and women who had established their cultural heritage. I saw that their understanding deteriorated over the years as their founders died and those who believed became fewer in number. They sank to the most gross and graphic form of human torture, debauchery, sexual perversions, and spiritual darkness imaginable. Actually, none of it was imaginable to me. I just saw it in a second. In truth, I am still haunted by the memory of it. Among many other heinous things, they were sa sacrificing young virgins and killing infants and children in the most awful manner they could oh. devise. It was horrifying to me then, and horrifying to me now, because I saw it as, it as it had happened, in great detail. They were doing this in part because of false religion, and in part to avenge themselves of similar atrocities of their enemies. Their minds and hearts and everything they did were saturated by war, revenge, and a lust for evil, for everything evil. Hmm. So he says that he could see and feel each person involved in these atrocities. He could actually feel the hatred, the rage, mm -hmm. and the resentment of those choosing to do these acts, as well as the fear and anguish of the victims. He said he could experience them on a spiritual level, that he didn't actually feel their pain, but he did understand how horrible the experience was. But then listen to this part. I could also hear the prayers of the few people among them who were still followers of Jesus Christ, who had the Holy Spirit, and who were still hanging on to the truth. These faithful few were like scattered little fires of truth over these islands. They hated what was happening to their people, and they mourned the generations that were lost. 
they were also compelled to deep secrecy of their beliefs, for the believers were prized as victims. Now, see, I see this the Lamanites and the Nephites at the very yeah. end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and today. Yes. Oh, you yeah. can't seek out yes. where you get death threats. Yeah. Yes. And we know this is going to happen right before the Savior. Yeah. We know that the saints of God will be persecuted. Yeah. So that's why I wanted to make sure. I love the little visual of little fires. And that's how I feel about coming with you sisters. I feel like we bring our little fire together into a bigger fire. We feed each other light, and then we go off and take our little fires kind of back to our to our own lives. I so like just to, no, go ahead. No. Okay, so we're I'm in a room with a lot of people who could do energy work. So I'm just kind of throwing this out there to kind of get some feedback. When you're reading that, it's interesting to me that he leaves his body and then he sees all this so that his body doesn't take on that stuff. Oh, interesting. Oh, his spirit? So he can have awareness, yeah. but yeah. not have his body be like, oh my gosh, it's now I, I can help them, them. I'm going to take it on, I'm going to do the, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, good point. Maybe that's a possibility. Yeah, that's an observation. Maybe that's how he didn't have to experience the pain. Yeah, so because he, he said he couldn't, he didn't take it, he didn't feel it, but he knew it. But he knew spiritually. Yeah. He knew yeah. it as a yeah. protection measure. Great so observation. So open his mind to it, but not she have to have his body to be afflicted by anything more. Yes. Yeah, I love that. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So then he said he was seeing evil spirits who were reveling in their pain. These evil spirits were glorying in it and urging mortals to do worse and worse things, giving them inspiration on how to prolong the suffering of their victims. I know. We have one more paragraph and then we're done with this unpleasantness. That's why we're not staying in chapter two. We're going to finish it. Um, he says, I don't believe mortals could even think of such evil acts and then forge a society and transition of such debauchery without the evil spirits urging them and instructing them in not just performing these acts, but how to religionize it over many years to make it traditional and acceptable to their entire society. And if you've seen Kylie Jenner's new ad for her makeup, mm -hmm. you haven't? No. Yeah. You know yeah. Kylie yeah. Jenner's yeah. new ad for okay. her makeup? Oh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, out. she's like naked and totally covered in blood and she's spreading blood all over her body. And I saw that and thought Whoa. of this. I'm like, I'm not sure us humans kind of think like it's a this. Line? I'm sorry? It's a makeup line? Yeah. It's a makeup line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the purpose? I would not buy it either. Mom is from America to Center. It's, it's another debauchery yeah. of lowering the standards of the people. That's yeah. all it is. Mom yeah. from America podcast just did the opposite. And she interviewed a girl who works in Trump's site house. And she's in her 20s, not married. And she started a makeup line. Um, with the stories of the women in the Bible, and Hannah does the highlighter. She tells the stories in the Bible, and you know Deborah this, and you know, and, and it's beautiful. So yeah. that you um, are buying a makeup line that has full of virtue and faith. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but it's interesting that these Opposition extreme all oppositions are around us right now because we will each have the opportunity to choose. Yeah, and because yeah. society used to be more aligned with that centrist Christian value. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, where now this left, really, darkness has pulled society, and the kids are kind of in the middle. Like, what? You know, yeah. do I believe in that? Is there really power in God? Yep. Is it just an organization or is there power? Yep. And I think we've lost some of that belief in the in the gifts yeah. of the spirit yep. as we become more of an organizationalized religion. Right? You don't hear people talking about it. Yep. So yep. they're seeing some some I don't know, darkness yep. reveling in this. But I do you know, really? we, we hear stories and I I think I believe some of them about the Epstein Island and oh, yes, you know, right. eating of infants to give them power. You know, so this kind of stuff is going on today. It, it's not, I mean, the Tahiti thing was from a couple hundred years ago. It, it's going on today. Yes, it is. It is. Absolutely. Okay. It probably works. One more, one more thing. When I had that, that experience over Chaco Canyon, yes. and then I said I was flying north, and I looked up, and I could see all those brilliant stars, and then I looked down on the ground, and I could see lights. Not as much as the heavens, but you could see like the earth was darkened, and you could see these lights. And I wonder if it was like these the little, little fires, fires right? Yeah. They're fires. Yeah. fires. But then when this group that they had to, they existed for 400 years, 
And they had temples down there, right? With great light. They were having things. But when darkness came into that valley, and they, they burned, and they destroyed, they amassed up their temples, and they destroyed. Then later on, archaeologists are now finding that some of the areas that go north along that line where they had had their sacred areas, they eventually find bones that are, have been boiled, and they will eventually find an enzyme that can only come if you've ingested human Ew. that existed. Yeah. So they had, whatever Animalized. destroyed them had gone into such darkness the that they were cannibalistic, yeah. which is what this is. is that well, the ultimate darkness. Now? Is that in Peru? No, that was What's in it? Chaco Camp going north. Oh, okay. Yeah, darkness eventually comes in. So that's why some of the, the Hopi and different Indians will say, we won't go in there yeah. because it's such darkness, right? There's something wrong. And that's why we went in with like a lot of prayers and wondering what's going on here. But we had some interesting experiences, right? Yeah. So. And I think the one thing that's important for us to all remember is this is actually about power. This is not just about pleasure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The people that are doing this, they're getting something for it. Satanic power. They are getting real power. So whichever makeup you choose whether it's the satanic makeup or it is the God makeup, there is an energy that comes with that that will affect you. And once people really realize that there is power on both sides, that's when they choose. And everyone here has chosen that we want to align with God's power. And we are trying to learn how to qualify for God's power. But on the other side, they have learned that there is power in Satan. Mm -hmm. And they are trying to qualify for his power because you also have to qualify for his power. I, um, I ordered the book. I have not received it. I wonder if the guy actually knows it. But he had written a book. <laughs> he's, a, he's like a Catholic minister or something. And he does do, he works with people that it's kind of like possessed type situation. Mm -hmm. And he goes, in all of the cases, after people have stepped away from that, they will tell me, let people know this is real. This is real power. We thought it was just pretend. We, yes, we thought did. it wasn't, it was harmless yep. because there was nothing in it. And then we found ourselves actually, like, overcome <coughs> the evil that was there. Yes. They didn't know. They didn't know. Yeah. And let me just ask, because we're going to talk about this for one more minute, and then we're going to move on to something better. But do you understand the power that is coming from the other side to connect it to children? Yeah. Hmm. Do you, what do you mean? Where the, why why children? Do you understand pure. it's why children? They, want they are purity. pure. Yeah. So I said mm -hmm. that if you're on God's side, the only way to qualify for God's power is to go yes. through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way. <clears throat> if you are unwilling to go through the blood of Jesus Christ, what is the next human that is closest to Christ in purity? Mm -hmm. And it's a child. Therefore, the blood of a child does have power. It just does. Yeah. And so, as long as we understand that this is a power thing, this is not just a bored, I want some sort of pleasure. Oh, it's, it's about power. But they also, when they make them suffer more, they believe that that has more power into the dark to give but, them more power. And there might be a level of truth to that if you look at our Savior. Right. Look what he suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, so... I know. So I don't. I don't want to focus on that. But I, just uh, I wonder if there's power in the abortion too. Oh, I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm. I'm sure. We're dealing with power here, yeah. not not just pleasure. Right. It's 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 much bigger. So than faith that. works both ways. Mm -hmm. to the light it, it works. Dark. It works both ways. Yes. Yeah. That's a very interesting. Concept. Yeah. So for whatever reason, Spencer did not. I'm sorry. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I, I got this overwhelming feeling that I should share this, but it was weird. I was dreaming, and. <clears throat> I uh, was in a big water house, and there was box there. Anyway, all of a sudden, this, this little gremlin kind of creature came at me, was trying to attack me and enter my body or something. And I think he did, because at one point, my, I woke up, I sat right up in bed, and my husband was trying to calm me down, because I have nightmares sometimes, and I, I bit him. <laughs> And I, I woke up at that point, and well, actually, no, I think I said a, a little a prayer. I, I said a prayer to, to cast out evil spirits, Good. and then I woke up. But mm -hmm. it was scary. Yeah. But I think there's probably a lot of people that have experienced something different 
It's some kind of evil or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, I, and it's hard to explain Even to my husband, dreams. but I knew what it was. Um, so I, I got up and went to the temple that day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. I, was, I can weird. tell you that I feel like I get more influenced by evil at night mm -hmm. than I do during the day. During the day, I'm very clued in. I'm very aware. But once you go into that theta and that, some of those delta waves, I feel like it's very... It's a lot easier for them because I'm not on my guard. I am at the point now where I shield myself every single night mm -hmm. so that they don't reach me when I sleep. Mm -hmm. Tell every us single us night. Yeah. Tell us how you shield yourself. I literally put myself into what, what we call a sacred observatory where I claim my space. I claim that this is, this is my space, only my space. If I have any feelings of darkness, I will cast out before I go to bed. And I will claim that this space is mine and only mine, and no invasive energies can come into my space. And, you know, all in the name of the Savior Jesus Christ. And that's you kind of need to object to that. Yeah, nighttime prayers, right, with a child. Yeah, we always say nighttime prayers. Yep. Yeah. I'm just finding that I have to be more specific and actually ask for the angelic heavenly protection when I sleep. If I forget, I seem to have a nightmare that night. So every time you guys, before you come, I, I raise my arm to the square and I cast out all evil spirits. And then I literally take my hands and say, shield this home. Yeah. And I, I go like this and I say, please shield this home. Have angels be with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I think thank it succeeds. You. We feel that. Yeah. And I think you can do that to yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we definitely need to shield and our homes. And especially places like this where we are bringing our little flames of light together, this would be a place where the adversary would love it if he could start antagonism between any of us. Mm -hmm. If any of us come and wait at each other, years. that energy would, would be here. You know, and we need to be sisters of light and brothers of light. <laughs> whoever, whoever comes, we need to be building each other up. But the adversary would be trying to tear us down, and so I'm grateful to Colette for shielding this home that it's a safe place for, for mm -hmm. us to make. I've taught in my family that, I, in, in my family, because I pray for my children's phones, over their mm -hmm. phones, their computers, their cars, their right. right. yeah. <laughs> that nothing evil will enter into those and kind of yep. kind of shield it from a prayer. Well, and then right. hopefully they're doing it themselves as well, but I say it publicly in front of them so they understand that I That's believe yeah. in being able to ask to yes. have that. Person. So this is, this is a battle. Mm -hmm. And we need to be calling down all the resources we have. And I think that's what most of us love about this book. Yeah. Is the resources that it gives us. You know? To be honest with you, I've read the book a couple of times, but just dissecting these things yeah, really. It's helpful. Yeah, it's not just a story of it's not days. No, no, there's no, so no, much there's so spirituality much that I think that you just gloss over. So I really appreciate you doing this for us. Good. Well, and the people Good. online have made a lot of comments. They really, really can wait for this, but <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're really appreciative. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the intercessory <clears throat> prayer because it really, this gets a little random. There's some tangents that he goes off here. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly he leaves, he leaves the vision in Tahiti, and now he's in the Beehive House in Salt Lake. And he can see television cameras and media around, and he doesn't know, you know, what is going on. Aren't they just getting ready to restore that? Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's yes. a Robin question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They've already restored the Joseph Smith building. And they're restoring the Joseph Smith place, too. They're yeah. doing it again? Yeah. They already did it. My dad is all involved in all that. Mm -hmm. Well, but then he's, he's told that what he's about to see oh, is no. it's a vision that's a metaphor, a type of things that would shortly come. So what he sees is that there's this fear and sadness around the beehive house. And he discerns that they are waiting for the current prophet of the church to die. And it caused him sorrow because the current prophet was his friend. I think he's talking about Gordon B. Hinckley. Wouldn't he be talking about Gordon B. Hinckley? I think so, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, it's not his apostolic friend. No, because he's talking about the prophet dying now. Okay. Yeah. So then well, he finds he died in what? 2008? 7, 8? Yeah, 7, 8. Yeah. Yeah. And he was prophet for a while. So that's why I thought it was Gordon B. Hinckley. Anyway, he never says. He never says. But suddenly he sees himself at the back of the beehive house that he's never been before. And anyway, he goes through the descriptions of what it is, and then he sees an elderly man kneeling on an antique 
oval rug by the bed. Can you tell us where you are? Oh no, 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 no. Just just listen. Don't follow along because okay. I'm I'm pulling okay. out pertinent pertinent things Don't now. Do. And he says he realizes that it's his apostolic friend, which was um, Neely Maxwell. And suddenly he feels like he has no right to be there. But then he's trying to leave, and the spirit says, listen well. And he was shown that this great friend and servant of God was in an intercessory prayer with the Father regarding himself and what he would experience in the future. He was pleading for the will of the Father to take place on his behalf and in behalf of his family. And he was praying that he would be able to endure it well and be empowered to drink of the bitter cup without becoming bitter himself. And how do you know this is Nelly Maxwell? Because Tom said. That's right. Oh, he told in a, yeah. did he have a session? Or? I, I, I don't know. He told a friend of ours that that's who oh, he said. That, that yeah. kind of quote there right. is Neil Maxwell's quote. Oh, it is? Drink of the bitter <gasps> cup without becoming oh, bitter. There you Good go. catch. Oh, I didn't know good. that. <laughs> I didn't what page is that? Uh, 50, 50, well, this yeah. book is 52. You've got the cream yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm just, I am just skipping around. Uh, so. like the yeah. fourth line up of but anyway, what a beautiful thing for us to remember. Help me to drink the bitter cup without becoming bitter myself. Um, and he said, these are the words that I heard him speak as he poured out his heart in prayer. And then he says, I am so confused. I've just seen this debauchery. And now I am seeing this beautiful intercessory prayer. He says, why are you showing me these things? And he says, I think it was the stark contrast was to teach me how suffering can actually sanctify and bring about exaltation when the sufferer submits to Christ and lets that suffering purify and complete his mortal experience. Why did I pull this part out? I pulled this part out because in the last days, we have to be purified collectively because the goal is sanctification. So let's link arms together as disciples of Christ and recognize that suffering purifies us for the end goal of sanctification because we want to be like Neil A. Maxwell was as we endure what is ahead. A really good comparative um, talk is by Boyd K. Packer called The Brilliant Morning of Forgiveness, where he talks about that very thing that innocence, going through being innocent of something that's not fair, also is a sanctification and gives you credibility as a witness before God and that no experience on this earth is wasted because we are witnesses. Even the children that are being abused, it's, it's horrible. I, I prayed just a lot the last few days about that. But we are witnesses, and there are courts on high. Thank you. Thank you. The other thing I like to add when you're reading that, um, Mark and I were talking earlier this week about what is time to God, and when you pray a prayer, which Karen and Prier kind of talked about before, can you pray a prayer of something that has already happened or something in the future? And he's speaking to that. He's praying for the future that he won't, he'll be there, he won't have to become bitter. Exactly. And so what can we do as far as our own preparation? And the Lord guides each of us, each of us to be prepared for the future at our own pace. But what can our prayer be for ourselves yes. in knowing this stuff that is happening and that it's there? What is, would my prayer be today for my future self? Exactly. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. I think most of us enter into these trials and we just grit our teeth and hold on. Yeah. <laughs> and I think Neil A. Maxwell, um, <clears throat> he did not pray for escape. He prayed for strength to endure it well. Mm. So what has Spencer learned from seeing this? That through suffering, mortals learn compassion, endurance, faithfulness, but also a willingness to be purified. I am not at that stage. No, I'm not, <laughs> not at that willingness. The yeah. compassion, endurance, and faithfulness, I can be there, but that willingness, oh. Yeah, but if you had vision like he had, and you're he's right. seeing what's coming, you bet your will is going to be changed. You're right. You're absolutely right. So let's <laughs> let's learn from him, right? Yeah. Let's learn from him. I, there is a scripture that says that women are sanctified through childbirth. Yes. Which, Which is very to, interesting. Yeah. That the childbirth is, to many, it will be unto death, but some it is to deny unto death. Yes. Right? But that process, we haven't looked at it in that way. I wonder 
if I change the way. Right, but I'm wondering not the dying. You're thing. almost at death when you do deliver. <laughs> yeah, but I wondered if we if we would put it in this context of suffering for life. You are. There's no other means for that, right? You are suffering for another life. But right? that's that's fascinating. Um, is that a checkmark? Place. On the, on the yeah, so that, well, we have it now, but men do not have it. Men will have it if they will sacrifice unto death as a like as a soldier in a righteous war, mm. and they put everything on the line for that. Protection. But right. yeah, women have that experience just to bring society into existence. Yep. So, so is it minimized if we have an epidural? Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> all good. I'm just saying. Okay. Can I ask you We die little deaths as we raise our children. Oh, yeah. As we give up our will, our selfishness, and our comfort zone to do what's right for our child. Yes. And I can't say I've always done that, but I can see the difference and yeah. what it costs me to take the high road. Yeah. yeah. I'm just talking about intense yeah. suffering that yeah. he was. Well, abusive. sometimes it's pretty intense. Yeah. Do any of your, we had it in church on Sunday, and when we get up and talk about our patriarchal blessing, that there was eight times the word joy was in our patriarchal blessing, mm. and about joy, and I was like, why does this all suffer, or, you know, mm -hmm. I'll be called upon to endure and witness suffering, sorrow, and heartache. Where's my joy? <laughs> I, I, I want your patriarchal joy blessing. Come to sign up for different ones. Where is that, do, does yours? Can Jane separate Sarah and Heartache anyone? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's raise it. Spencer said he learned from this. All right. Because maybe we can all so learn. And here's the lesson for Tammy. <laughs> so this is what Spencer said he learned. That he realized he would be called to suffer. So that he could be purified, completed, and Christ-like when he left mortality. And he had to submit to this process willingly. Boy, that should be on our bathroom mirror. Then some, I'm sorry. Go I was ahead. just going to say, I think all of our blessings kind of say you're going to have your trials and tribulations as mine does, but mine also says be of good cheer. Mm -hmm. Meaning go through it easily and correctly and properly because yes, we're all going to suffer, but be of good cheer, this is part of the process. Yes. I think of pain as the perfect healer. We don't know we need to heal unless we experience that pain, wherever that pain is. So when I get a pain in my body, emotionally, physically, I go, okay, where do I need to go to heal it, to refine it, to perfect it, to make that process go through it? Exactly. My daughter is an, a nurse in the baby department, and she said, these babies being born now are so different, and they're calling it the COVID babies, but they are stronger, they're healthier, they're, you know, more the birth. You feel the spirit when these babies are being born. She mm -hmm. said, and many of them are coming out blue and purple and are having a struggle coming out, but once they come out, how much stronger these babies are. And I think it's these valiant spirits that really are safe for these latter days that we, the mommies, have to teach them to light your own little fire, protect your own self. So you're coming to, you know, we would teach our babies to say their prayers at night, but now we have to not only teach them to say their prayers at night, but to protect them from the night. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the babies that are being born in the world right now, they're different babies. They've come in for a slightly different purpose. They really, they really have, and I think you can feel it. Yep. Then his vision, his vision changes, and now um, he sees his friend again, but this time he hears he's pleading for him and what he was going to be going through. He was speaking in the same fashion, but this time he was pleading for him, and he was weeping. Both of these prayers were long, protracted, and beautiful pleading to the Father. His words overwhelmed him, and he felt deep concern that somehow he was creating this pain and struggle in his friend. It was also confusing and troubling that he had seen some of his future struggles and was obviously concerned on his behalf. So Spencer says, Oh, Father, please bless this man, that if it be possible, he may not have to endure these things on my account. And then he said, What have I done? What has happened to me to cause my friend to struggle in my behalf? And why am I seeing this? Please help me to learn what I must learn from this. What a beautiful way to handle what he's seeing when it must be incredibly confusing. And he said it did frighten him a little bit to ponder that. 
and then it ends. There's no answer. How often does God do this to us? <laughs> he gives us something to stew on, to think about, and then doesn't give us any more. He lets us figure it out on our own. And then his vision changes again. And now he's back to the prophet of the church. So remember, this is when the prophet is dying, and he suddenly <clears> hears <throat> a healthy prophet saying, uh, it's going to be all right. Could this be Benson, though? I don't know, maybe it's Benson. Somebody, somebody earlier. Right? Maybe it was maybe Benson. Maybe, you're yeah. right. Maybe it was yeah. Benson. I don't know. Because this is 1995. Yeah, you're right. He's in Tahiti. It was Hunter. I, oh, it was I Hunter? It up. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Dan. Exactly. You're looking at the timeline. 1995. Well, I apologize. I don't even think of Hunter. I go straight from Benson. You know, I don't know. He's there. 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 So again, he tells him it's going to be all right. And then the prophet walks away. So remember, this prophet is dying, but right in his vision, he's walking. And he turns back and he says, Just like my Savior, it is finished. And I knew that he was speaking of his own life, rejoicing that it was over, and that, it, that he had triumphed. That's it. That's the vision that he got to see of the prophet, saying, It is finished. And he knew that the, the prophet had died. Then he said it was time to leave. He said, but there's a guard right there. And the guard says, Spencer, wait a second. And um, the guard had been reading some scriptures. And he just turned around and handed the scriptures to him. And he realized that there was some sort of symbolism in this act, but he didn't understand it. And that's all that happens there. But later, he says these scriptures were green. And he's never seen these green scriptures before. But he said later his wife had given him, at this next Christmas, the exact same green scriptures that this guard had given to him in his dream. Wow. So sometimes the Lord, is in his tender mercies, he gives us these little tiny experiences and then validates them a little, a little mm -hmm. bit later. Um, so then he says, I remember then re-entering my body back in Tahiti, and it took about three days to regain my strength. And he said that there was so much that had happened that I really couldn't make sense of it. Um, and then he says he comes back and he realizes that the prophet had died while he'd been in Tahiti. Mm -hmm. so, then, so you see the Lord is kind of tying up all these loose ends. Um, but I love the very end of the chapter because um, he says when he gets back, he went to his cardiologist, had an EKG and found that it was a valve that was not working. And the cardiologist said, I want to insert a pig valve into your heart. And he said, I declined the surgery because I felt impressed it wasn't necessary. Do you see how, what a small impression that is? It's not necessary. No other explanation from the Lord. And what does he say? I didn't have it, and I recovered. Who are we going to trust? The cardiologist telling you, you're going to die without the pig heart. And the spirit just says it's not necessary. Well, let me tell you, my brother had a pig valve transplant, mm. and it's temporary. And so had he done that, he would have had to have gone through that again to get a cadaveric uh, valve if he could. So he probably would have had many more problems. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. But the message is, all this pressure from the experts in our world, and then on the arm of flesh, and a little tiny voice that doesn't explain any of that. The spirit didn't say, you won't need it, you're going to heal, you'll have more pride. He didn't say anything. <clears throat> spirit just says, it's not necessary. Which one are we going to listen to? It, we have that fight on a daily basis. The quiet voice or the loud voice. 